uh, glucagon does create an upward pressure on glucose. Its primary job is to make sure blood glucose is high. Now, if it had its way, it would make sure glucose is much higher than we'd want it. Once upon a time, and this is just a couple decades ago, normal glucose levels were considered anything below 150. And I, I'm just cynical enough to think, why have we lowered that? Now, on the generous side, we would say, well, because we found that if it was higher than that, we're around there, it was really catastrophic to health. That might be true. That might be true. Alternatively, it's also a wonderful way to diagnose people with a disease and put them on drugs much, much earlier. So by lowering the threshold, a lot more people are getting over that bar. You know, where glucose, when glucose levels were uh, considered normal up to 150, not a lot of people were getting over it. Thus, few people were being diagnosed with the problem and there was much less drugs to be sold. By lowering that, th that bar, that threshold, now a lot of people are just stepping right over it because it's so low. So I am admittedly a little bit of a cynical guy as I'm getting older, but also I'm too aware of the fact that in, in diabetes or, or prediabetes insulin resistance, it's insulin that's really causing the primary problems. It's not the glucose. Now I'm not saying glucose is benign. I'm not saying that at all. There's no question it can contribute to problems. In fact, even catastrophically when it comes to like poly uh, dumping glucose into the urine and, and lowering blood volume and the person going unconscious. Um, but that's, very uncommon and that's glucose levels that are up into the 200s when that normally starts to happen the average person is sitting at a state of normal glucose yet hyperinsulinemia because of the insulin resistance and this is the person who's starting to experience cognitive decline which is an area of research in my lab where it's an insulin problem the insulin resistance of the hippocampus they're starting to experience hypertension they're starting to experience auditory issues and infertility fatty liver disease these are not problems of glucose. These are problems of insulin. So if I see someone who's on a low carbohydrate diet and their insulin is at three micro units per mil and their glucose level is at a hundred, I am inclined to give them a high five because to me, that's a perfectly healthy range for the person to be in. There are a couple known distinct biochemical problems when glucose is chronically elevated. Glycation is one of them. And of course the hemoglobin A1C or hemoglobin glycation is a is a test in order to kind of capitalize on that. The hemoglobin A1C test came in, into vogue and basically single-handedly killed the oral glucose tolerance test because it was thought that the A1C is going to give us a better, kind of better overall information than an oral glucose tolerance test, which I believe is not at all true. There's no question that glucose is a problem. I, however, don't know that it's ever been quantified measuring the degree of glycation from, say, 85 to 110. Is it, is it really moving the needle that much? I, I don't know that it is. I've not seen that quantified. I've never seen that really put together well. So I'll be a little agnostic until we can see something and I'll continue to kind of poo-poo it. But the dynamic test is not the same as the fasting test because if someone can't get their clinician to do an oral glucose tolerance test and that would not be easy to do because it takes a lot of time at the clinic and time is money where you're having to sit around and go in for multiple tests you can do it on your own that is what is so powerful is that while i am somewhat um, indifferent or don't have too much respect for just chronically measuring fasting glucose because insulin could have changed years before the glucose is changing. That is not the same as that, st that static measurement of glucose at a fasted state coming into the clinic once a year is not the same as the dynamic glucose changes that can happen when we're eating foods. And someone can see I've eaten this carbohydrate heavy food or whatever it may be. And oh my gosh, my glucose levels spiked up to high hundreds and it stayed elevated for four hours. The dynamic view of glucose, I think, has tremendous diagnostic value because if someone is insulin resistant, another outcome of this is typically going to be a glucose intolerance. If you're insulin resistant, you're going to generally be glucose intolerant. Now, you can be glucose intolerant and not insulin resistant for other reasons, but nevertheless, if you are insulin resistant, you will have some degree of glucose intolerance. So you've eaten that carbohydrate heavy snack and it's going to take you a long time to clear it. And it might be really messy on the way. You've come down and you're right back up and now you're high again. It's dropped and come back up. All that kind of noise is a warning sign. And you don't get that noise when you just measure one single moment in time. Or in other words, the fasting static blood glucose test that everyone is, goes in and does. And that we're all content with because too few of us know that there's another option.